Hi, my name is Kevin Jesko. Um, I've been wood turning for about a year and a half, maybe a little longer. I'm a member of uh, Northwest Wood Turners for about as long. And uh, one of the things I've started doing, I do a lot of hollow forms, and lately I started doing these ones with natural openings. Some people have taken some interest in that and asked me to do this demo. Um, so these are some of my recent ones. Uh, the piece I'm going to demonstrate today is going to be similar to this one. It's a little bit, a little bit simpler than these. I think uh, you know anybody can try something like this. I think burls work best for these just because they have the, the kind of ragged edge on the opening. Um, this this piece of ash was kind of nice um, with a live edge just because it kind of has that jagged bark. If the bark had come off though, it would just had a smooth opening there. Um, but by all means, you know, try it with anything you got. Um, this piece of, of cherry didn't have too much there. The opening's kind of small, um, but overall it's not too bad. And the same thing kind of translates to turning pieces with even just big bark inclusions or voids. Um, this piece was pretty beat up and maybe I shouldn't have turned it <laughs> as cracks through the bottom. But, but you know, you get the idea there with the big scar line. Um, and it's very similar. So the basic thing is that you just want to make a form that's bigger than your piece of wood in some way. So here, you know, the form is is bigger than where the surface of this was, where it was dented in. And so then when you hollow it, you end up with this big natural opening. Um, so that's the basic principle. And uh, we'll see if we can get that done today. So I want to create a piece like this. And so to do that, I'm looking at you know, this, this part here is gonna be, the form is gonna be bigger than this part of the wood. So I take a slow piece of, of burl like this and I'm visualizing where that curve is gonna come up. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this, you know, somewhat round on the bandsaw so I have less to do on the lathe. But I'm kind of looking at a piece in here to make this happen. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. So to illustrate this idea a little bit better, here's our burl cap. And over this, I'm just gonna impose our desired form which will look something like this. And then once that we put it on the lathe, we're gonna turn away everything that's not within that form. And the end result will look something like this. So to start off, I'm going to mount the piece between centers. Um, it just kind of helps me position it and make sure that I am going to get that void where I want it. Um, also, it's just the way I start all my forms. Um, so we're going to put the tendon on this side. So I'm going to put this towards the tailstock. All right. I'm going to turn the lathe on, bring it up to speed, um, and just see how it balances on there. I'm sure we're going to have some wobble. That's about 500 RPM. I think that's a good speed for, for roughing this piece. I'm gonna leave it there. That's nice. So I'm really just making it around right now. Uh, unfortunately, I see a pretty bad crack there. We'll just leave it. Um, and uh, so now I'm gonna go ahead and put the tendon on it. It's still not quite there. There's a little flat over here, but um, you know we still have more shaping to do anyway, but it's round enough to, to go ahead and get this back in flattened and put the tendon on it. Mm-hmm. 
So I'm gonna start shaping the bottom. One of the things I do, I like to put on rounded bottom in a lot of my pieces. Can you see that okay? I like to put a rounded bottom and in order to do that, you have to put a little step in there next to the tenon. Um, that allows you to have that meat there to continue the curve of the piece through when you reverse turn the foot off of it. So you notice the tenon that I'm making is, is square to the shoulder. Um, that's because I like to use the one-way profile jaws. Um, the size of the diameter isn't quite as critical as a dovetail jaw. Um, its gripping strength is pretty good over the whole thing. And also it, it's just a simple straight um, sided tenon. Um, so that's what I'm forming here. So before I, I totally finish my tenon here, I need to square it up still. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start shaping the bottom, start bringing it up, up the sides, and uh, get an idea what the final form is going to look like. So I'm just gonna go ahead and square up my tenon now so I can mount it in the chuck, and then we'll flip it around and start working on the top half. Not all to do it. So here, close to my, my life center, um, is where the, this is gonna become this part here, the, the high edge, the natural edge of the lip. So I wanna, I'm gonna start to take this down and shape the outside and blend it into the bottom curve. Uh, but I wanna be conscious to leave, leave that bit of meat there so that in the end I'll still have this natural edge. You want to stop frequently and take a look at what you're left with so you don't go crazy. Um, oof. It's going to have some ugly cracks in the back side of it, but hopefully the rest of it will make up for it. So you see I cut back quite a bit of the, di the diameter too. I just decided that it's gonna be a little too, it won't be tall enough for the width that it was there. So I'm gonna take the whole thing back and uh, just tighten it up a little bit. But overall, I think this, this shape it looks pretty good or it will look pretty good. I do quite a bit of shear scraping to refine my form. Um, hopefully, <laughs> it's not too uh, too boring.
So here I just want to blend my curves into each other um, so that there's not an abrupt shift from one to the other. And clean all this up. So I bumped up the speed just a little bit. Um, even now, it seems to be going kind of slow for the size of the form it is now. Um, also for the scraping, kind of want more speed. And because there's air, we're going to be cutting air through here um, where the surface dips down. I want to make sure it's going fast enough to, to make it over that easily and not get, get caught in it, if that makes sense. And I'm going to cut, I'm going to do another pass and I'm going to cut from the bottom to the top uh, just try and clean it up and to shape the form just a little bit better. And now I have a little ridge right here and I'm just going to blend that in. I have to move my tool rest though. And we'll do some hauling. Still quite a bit of tear right there I want to try and take care of. Um, just because you can't, you don't want to sand it too aggressively later or you round over all the little, the little edges going into the void. I'm going to turn the speed up a little bit higher. See if I can just feather that out real quick. That's better. There's just a tiny bit there and it's it's back here, not near an edge. So I'll just spot sand that out later um, before I finish it. So I have a one-way um, lathe here, so it has a fixed headstock. Um, and to, to hand hollow, I think you really need to be able to tuck your arms into your side and move your body tight, um, which you can't do over the ways. So uh, with the one-way, I'm able to do it on the outboard side. I have a small extension and I'm going to do my hollowing over here. Um, if you have one of the many lays with a sliding headstock, just slide it down towards the end. You can work off the end um, and achieve the same thing. Um, so that's why if you notice the camera angle is different, we had to move things around a little bit. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is make a depth hole. Um, so I'm just going to kind of eyeball how deep I want it to be, keeping you know about a quarter inch off the bottom of the vessel. And then uh, I just mark it like so and put a piece of tape on there. And then I'll just plunge this in by hand. It's only a 3 8 inch drill bit. Um, and I've gone, you know, even almost all the way down and have had no trouble going in and out. You know, you, you want to pull it out if you're going deep and clear the flutes. But um, I, I don't see the need to, to go through the trouble of getting something mounted in the headstock just to make a small depth hole. Um, this also, this depth hole not only is for the depth, but will also um, get that center core out. So you're not fighting it all the way down. Um, you know, because if you're not if you're not dead center on height, then you'll end up getting a little cone down through the middle that you have to constantly fight with, and can make the the um, tool jump and break your lip and cause all kinds of trouble. So this just kind of prevents that usually. So before I drill my death hole, <laughs> I was going to take my 3A spindle gouge, detail gouge, and uh, just make a small divot there so the the drill bit has something to to follow into the hole. Okay. 
That should be good enough. good enough so so for hollowing this piece I'm going to use 3 8 inch um, hollowing tools with high-speed steel tips um, I like the high speed I can touch it up quickly on the CBN grinder when I need it to, to be sharper so I'll start hollowing with the, the straight tool and I'm gonna open up my hole a little bit make it a little bit wider I'll also use this uh, towards the bottom of the piece and the rest of the hollowing will be done with the curved tool uh, there's a spot near the mouth where this isn't going to be a tight enough radius for me to, to get the curve that I want, the profile that I want. So for that, this modified Allen wrench, uh, just to help me shape that, the inside of the lip there uh, to the profile that I want. So first, you know, when using the straight tool, well, any, any hollowing tool, you want to make sure the cutter is, is at, or just actually just slightly above center. Um, so this should be pretty good, I feel. Um, the opening, I'm probably going to make it about uh, three quarter of an inch to an inch. So basically, I want to have about an eighth inch here um, left, and that'll be my wall thickness all the way through the piece. So I'm going to start by opening that hole up a little bit, chasing it down towards the middle, giving myself some room to get the hook tool in and take the meat out of the, the sides of it. So when I'm hollowing, I have I'm holding the tool like this, um, and that you know the the handle is running along my forearm, and I have it tucked into my side. As I move the piece, I'm moving my body side to side. Especially if you're doing something taller towards the bottom, this is a good you know gives you good control at the bottom. Um, I'm not crouching down trying to look inside the hole. I'm just looking at the opening and making sure that I'm not hitting that with my tool um, as I'm going deeper. So. When I was watching somebody sand. So now I've established my opening size. Um, it's about about halfway down. So at this point, I'm going to take my modified Allen wrench and uh, start to come in the lip right here and see what that's going to look like. We're going to start to see the this side open up, um, and we'll go from there. These tools are very short, the on wrenches, so I wanted the tool rest to be close, obviously with clearance.
So here you can see a ragged edge just starting to form. Um, and now I have a little bit of a lip here. So I'm gonna go back to the straight tool and work that lip down. Um, and then I'll come in uh, more with a hook tool, probably the 3 8 one at that point. Raise off the torus there. You do want to stop frequently and clear out shavings, um, whether it's with air or, or some kind of tool that you can pull them out with. Um, especially if you're working green wood, because um, it'll build up a lot of steam and heat and can crack your piece. Now I'm going to come in with my hook tool. For this, can you see this again? So the cutter is in line with the straight part of the shaft here. So you want to make sure that your tool rest is back here. Um, it seems like you're standing way off the tool rest and to some extent you are, but that gives you the leverage for it not to, to roll. If the tool rest is here, now every time when that cutter hits the wood it's just going to pull it down and it's going to kick it up and break your mouth so you want to keep the tool rest on the straight part of the shank really loving it Can you hear me okay? Like this? So I don't know if you see my body moving, but I'm just kind of nibbling at the edge. I don't know, a 30 second at a time. Just back and forth. Working it down. And just starting to open it up in here. It's still pretty straight sided. Um, but in a minute, It'll be far enough down and start to come through and we'll see the cutter start to break through these these edges here. We start to see the ragged edge forming. Um, if you notice, I'm cleaning it out real quick. Now, if you want to move the camera when it's spinning and show the that you can see the you know the clear circle in the middle. So, so the edge is starting to elongate. Um, but where I need to keep the cutter is is a circle that follows this radius here. And when it's spinning, you can see that there just barely so you want to be careful um, to keep your tools within that smaller circle in the middle there uh, if you go outside of that you're just going to break the mouth right off of it right. so so also this is burl wood so i'm kind of going back and forth with the cutter um, sometimes it cuts pretty good in both directions um, if it's like an end grain piece, then typically it only cuts well on a pull stroke. The push stroke doesn't cut so well. Um, side grain, it just depends on, on the grain of the piece, but typically um, a push works as good as a pull on a side grain. That's what I found. Anyway. As you may notice, I, I wait till the piece is spinning to put my tool in and I pull it out while it's still spinning. 
Um, I just find that easier to, to follow the hole that you can see, the circle you can see while it's spinning, um, than to try and put it in here and reach over and turn the lathe on and maybe you're not in the right position, it comes around and you bounce your tool and break the vessel right away. So now I've worked down to about where I initially widened the hole with my straight cutter. So I'm going to go back to the straight piece and uh, open that up a little more, bring it further down, give myself more of a lip to nibble away at with the curved cutter. This is the one disadvantage I see of like a captured system is it, it's inconvenient to switch back and forth with the tools. Um, so I don't think that you do it as often maybe as you should um, for hollowing. So pretty much now I'm just doing more of the same. Uh, working on my wall thickness here, starting to get closer. Um, when I do feel like I'm getting really close, I'll use a little pair of just bent wire calipers to, to get an idea if it's consistent. Um, of course, consistency is gonna be more critical in a green piece of wood, because you want it to dry evenly. Um, but, you know, just for craftsmanship, I wanna keep it consistent. So far it feels pretty good. make the inside bigger than the outside. And of course another thing about a natural edge vessel is that you can see that wall thickness all the way through so people will know and judge you. <laughs> He's a little touchy. Ha, <laughs> 
Did it survive? It survived. Don't do that. <laughs> All right. So now again, I have a big flat section here, so I'm just gonna work on that a little bit. I think I have a big enough hole down here to nibble away with this tool, but I noticed that I'm getting a little far off the rest. I'm gonna move it closer. So you probably notice there's a lot of chatter. There's a lot of things that contribute to that. Um, you know, I might be slightly high or low with my cutting. The angle of attack might be a little off. The fact that the tool is only three eighths and is already extended this far off the tool rest or further, um, and it's dry wood. Um, if it gets excessive to the point where it's vibrating through your hand, you want to stop and assess what's going on, but a little bit of noise is pretty common. Back just a hair, it's a little too, too close. I can see the, the cutter tip working down there, like I can see where it is in the vessel, so there's enough of an opening and with the light reflecting off of it. I joked it was the original visualizer. <laughs> So one thing I want to say to you, like with my body motion, um, I'm also, I'm looking at the outside of the vessel and the outside curve, and I'm kind of following that with the way I rock my body. Um, again, I think it just helps keep that, that wall thickness, you know, consistent and, uh, and gives you a cleaner finish. I don't scrape or sand the inside, so whatever comes off the cutter is what it's going to be. And I don't have a good reason for that, I just don't do it. And I noticed I moved it a little too far away. Let's try that. So here, go ahead and kind of check where things are at. So, hold on, let me turn this so the camera can see. So here you can see it's still, the gap is gone there, so it's, it's this thick at that point. Whoops, this thick at that point. Whereas back here, it's about halfway between. So I'm doing a lot of work from this side, so I'm gonna reposition my tool rest, like so. That way I have more support when I'm in here. This is kind of neat, stayed intact. I'm just kind of sneaking up on my wall thickness here before I go deeper. Things a little more. Mm-hmm. 
That feels pretty consistent. Let's see. I'm getting my fingers in. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now back to the straight for a little bit. Okay, I'm going to sharpen this real quick. All right, so I'm just going to sharpen the tip real quick. Uh, I like to use the radius wheel because it's quick and easy. I don't have to take it out of the tool. Um, the platform's here, but I'm not really using it. It's not set to any angle. I'll use it back here for support, but I'm just going to kind of drag the tip across both sides of the radius. And across the tip just a little bit. So I'm at the bottom of my hole, and now I'm just kind of widening it with the straight tool, sweeping it across the bottom, trying to kind of follow this, this arc. And I'll do a little more with the straight tool before I switch back to the, the bent one. Now with my calipers, if I do this, hold it this way, I can see the top. If I flip it around, now this hook, I can check the bottom. And still pretty thick right there, but here. Still pretty thick. All right. Perfect. And then switch over to the bent tool. So now I'm working somewhat blind again. I'm past all the uh, all the void, and so I'm going to stop and just check it more frequently to see where it's at. It's still really thick right there. bottom. Switch back to the straight tool for that. Before I get too carried away on the bottom, I do want to check the depth, at least eyeball it. Make sure I'm not going to go all the way through the bottom of it. So here I'm looking at where it's at and also I'm looking at the radius and seeing when I reverse it, if I continue to follow that radius, where's the actual bottom going to be? Uh, and that looks about where it needs to be. It looks like I can just blend it a tiny bit more there and there's a little bit of a a little bit of meat here that can come out.
So from here out, it's really just fine tuning. And it looks pretty good. So there's just a little nub in the bottom there. I'm just gonna smooth that out um, and then call it good on the inside. This is one time where I will turn it on with the tool in there, being the straight tool and lined up, just because I know now where that nub is and I can hopefully keep it right there, slowly advancing and just get rid of it. Okay. No. So the next step is going to be to reverse chuck the piece and uh, remove this tenon and, and continue this curve down through the bottom. Uh, there's a few options. I use uh, the one-way vacuum chuck for quite a few of my pieces. I didn't know if it was going to work for this one or not, but it does. Um, there's enough of a shoulder there for it to grab it. Um, you know, obviously if your piece is very thin or frail around the edges, you want to be careful. Another option and one that I used for this piece is I, I just turned down this little mandrel, which I mounted in a chuck, and was able to put pressure between that and the bottom and the tailstock to turn off the bottom of it. Um, most of my hollow forms that are solid, I'll use again, I use the vacuum chuck, but before I, without vacuum even, because a lot of times there is a crack or void or something else that won't hold vacuum, but it makes a good round surface just to hold the end of a vessel. Um, but before I bought those, I had made this, um, uh, glue block, I guess, but I didn't use it as a glue block, I used it as a jam chuck. I guess that's what it would be, okay, so a friction chuck, jam chuck, and uh, just scooped out the inside so I'd have room for the mouth to sit and that uh, the vessel would ride, you know, you know the shoulder and the shoulder here um, without the end touching anything. And that worked pretty good for a while, um, but I really like these, these vacuum chucks. All right, so I'm gonna use my, my vacuum chuck here as a, as a friction chuck or a jam chuck. Uh, there's no vacuum to it because it's not going to do anything with this piece. Um, but it's just a, a good diameter to hold the shoulder of the vessel. Um, I still have the old tailstock mark in place from when I turn the tenon. So I'm going to use that to help me line it up. And I'm really terrible at getting it perfectly aligned. At this point, 95% to me is good. I'll turn it and I always finish the bottom uh, sanding it off the lathe anyway when I want a curved bottom um, so I can just blend in any little shoulder that's created there because of that. That's not not there yet. Takes a little bit of tapping and fudging. That, that's pretty good. That's probably 96% there. Make sure you have enough tailstock pressure and you want, you know, if this is, whatever it is, you know, if you're using the piece of wood, you know, if you put a block on a faceplate and carve it out, um, you're gonna wanna put a pad in there of some sort, a piece of leather or whatever it is. Make sure once you have it lined up that you remember to put enough pressure to, uh, to actually seat it against that and compress it enough to hold it in place. Um, Put in a lot of work at this point. You don't want it flying off the lathe and breaking. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and start it and bring it up to speed. It's not gonna be nearly as fast as when I was actually turning it. Um, I'll probably go for four or 500. We'll see how wobbly it gets. No, it's not gonna do me any good going that way. That should be good enough, and that's about 500 RPM.
Trying to pick up the radius here and just kind of bring that curve around some. It's not going to be perfect, but like I said, I, I'm going to say used to finishing it off the lathe, so I don't sweat it too much. Think it's a little too clean. So you see there's a little bit of ridge on one side, it's even on the other. Should be fine. The last little bit of a nub, I don't get too creative with that either. Um, I just cut it off with a saw and then when I sand it all, I just blend it all together. I should have just sanded it all off since it's so small, but whatever. All right, so. Okay. So I could have, you know, I could have sanded, I guess, some of this piece on the lathe while it's spinning, but you don't want to sand this area or else you're just going to round over all these bits here. Um, every time that it passes by, the sandpaper is going to dip in that opening and, and round over the tips. Um, so I prefer to sand it off the lathe to try and avoid that. I could have probably sanded some of the bottom, but because the way I make a round bottom, um, I do that off the lathe anyway. Um, and what I do is I just use the lathe to drive my uh, three inch sanding pad mounted in Jacob Chuck. And I'll start with, uh, you know, 120 or 180, probably, probably 180 on this because it sands pretty easy and without a backing pad and just round off that nub um, while it's spinning. You just want to work it um, and just keep, keep bringing it up. Um, once I get the nub gone and it starts to round, I'll set it down frequently and check to make sure it's balanced, not lopsided. Um, if it's leaning one way or the other, you know, if it's, if it's leaning this way, then you have too much meat on the opposite side. So you want to smooth that a little bit. Um, don't get carried away. You can go through the bottom if it's thin. Ask me how I know that. Um, but that's how I create the rounded bottoms that, you know, end up like this piece and uh, just kind of rocks there. Once that I have it established without the backing pad, the, the original grit, I'll work my way through the grits with, the, with a, a light soft foam backing pad. Um, that keeps it from creating any flats and just helps you smooth it out. And uh, once that the shape is established, the rest of the grits, you know, go super quick. All you're doing is removing the scratches of the previous grit. Um, and that's, that's it. That's my secret. The point apart. So this one, this one I actually did sand on the lathe a little bit while I was spinning and it's a little bit rounded. Um, this one, what I'll do is I'll just do it by hand with, with uh, sandpaper. Um, I don't think it'll be too tedious with this wood. It sands real easy. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Try and keep those sh edges sharp. I will work, I will work my way up with the pad on, you know, I can get the radius. Um, I'll work my way up to some of these edges just over here. I'll, I'll leave that probably just to do by hand. And then this, this back edge right here. So, um, since I'm sanding off the lathe, or at least finishing my sanding, even on a normal vessel, um, you know, I'll sand as much as I can on the lathe, but I always finish the bottom off. Um, I don't, I don't apply finish on the lathe either. I do all my finishing off the lathe. Um, I like to use oil. Uh, I've been using a tried and true linseed oil product. Although 
I may experiment with some other ones, but my process is basically once it's sanded to 400 grit, apply the oil, wipe it off, um, let it cure for eight hours or whatever the box, you know, whatever the can says. Um, steel wool, four aught, oil free steel wool, and then uh, apply another coat. I do that three times. The first coat, especially, it doesn't soak in incredibly, and the figure like this will look flat, um, but it'll pop out by the third coat. So just stick with it. Um, and that's that's it really i mean i try and keep it to a simple finish i used to like using like waco danish oil um, and usually it's just you know one time on 15 minutes later second coat wipe it off um, and then you're done with it but i decided to move towards something that's a little more uh i don't know less toxic i don't have to wear gloves when i use it and uh yeah that's my secret of finishing so preferably before I put the finish on, um, I will sign it. I use a, a wood burning pen with a ball tip and uh, just kind of came up with a signature that I can do with that pretty easily on most pieces. Um, once that I do that, you know, I'm still ready. The piece already sanded up to 400 or 600 grit um, and that does raise the edge some. Usually I can just knock it back down with steel wool. If I have to hit it again with 400 grit sandpaper, I will and then just proceed with the oil as normal. If I forget an oil at first, I burn my signature on afterwards and uh, have no trouble with that either.